So we know we just did a baby dedication, and I can't help but say this. We know that toddlers have the worst patience in the world, right? You take something away, they get mad. You kind of throw a fit at them, they get mad. But no matter what, we all have patience because we don't want our child to have that same reaction to someone else. We also know that the same thing goes for our teenagers. They can't go somewhere, they throw a fit whatever the case may be. For our home, what we do is when our toddler throws a fit, we do the candle method. Has anyone ever heard of the candle method? All right, take your hand like this. Use our candles. We tell her to blow them out. Now, what she does now is she, we tell her they're trick candles because it changes the situation. So we say blow, and she says, I got trick candles. We said, yes, ma'am, you do. And eventually that calms her down. One person said that patience is the opposite of fits of rage or short temper. It is the quality of staying with people even when constantly wrong and irritated by them. What we see is that patience and long suffering out of Galatians goes hand in hand. God's long suffering, his patience is grace to us. And then we see that patience also takes time when it's not even our time. Psalm 37, 7, and this is just the first part of it, says that we should rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. We know that God also has compassion. Isaiah 49, 19 says, can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. And then the classic James 1, 19 says, that we should be slow to anger, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and here's my daughter. <laughs> All right, let's look at Galatians 5, 22 through 23. <laughs> Molly, please blow your candles out. All right, it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against all things. There is no law. Each of those references deals with the fruit of the Spirit, makes reference to the Holy Spirit. We think about patience that comes from the Holy Spirit of many examples, but the main one that we can think of has to be in Genesis, Adam and Eve broke the law of the Lord or disobeyed God. Rather than God just smite them, what he did was he had compassion for them. He loved them still no matter what. He clothed them but still sent them on their way. The Greek meaning of, the Greek meaning from Galatians that, we, that we, we find this idea of patience is remaining firm under trials and tests. And the second part is that we're in Exodus, we see there's the spirit of calmness. So we all view patience. So as believers, we should all view patience as being part, as being patient with each other refusing to be irritated by the wrongs that others do to us. So each person can agree that we've been wronged by somebody somewhere at some time, but we have to also have joy in our hearts and still be patient with them as well. We can think of patience as not trying to show our ugly side. We can think about the times that we're trying to rush out the house because our kids have sports, or our kids have something going on, or being cut off on the interstate. And if you know that interstate, if you do 70, you need to do 100. And if you don't do 100, then you're just gonna get kind of pushed off to the side. But it's in those very times when we should be patient, especially on the roads, that usually there's a little thing called blue lights behind us. And those same blue lights are ready to pull you over. And we just gotta hope that we have patience and grace from the same officer that he would you know, be kind to us. Do you want to stand up here, baby? <laughs> Patience and grace. We should have named Molly Grace. <laughs> Jason, are you okay with that? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Today's theme is blow out your candles. <laughs> Children are a blessing. My sticker says, go ask your mom. So, Molly, go ask your mom. All right. 
Where was I? So we know that back in, well, we don't know this. If you ever read, there's a book by Charles Sheldon, written in 1896. The title of the book was In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? And back in 1989, a um, youth pastor, leader, did the same thing based off the book to, to help her students understand what would Jesus do. And by the age group that we have here, who does not remember the WWJD bracelets? Everyone had it. You had it on the shirt, you had, it, you had the bracelet, you had the hat. What that did was it reminded us that we should think about Jesus at that moment. What would he do in those uneasy times, those times that you were angry? <clears throat> you heard someone say, what would Jesus do? It was also a, rem or a reminder for the, the moral decisions. And the verse that that came from is this, 1 Corinthians 1, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, which says, be imitators of me just as I, sorry, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. So what Paul wanted his believers to do was to imitate him just as he did Christ. Our best um, think of patience come from Nehemiah 9, 17. It says, they refuse to listen they do not remember your wondrous deeds, which you have performed among them. So they became stubborn and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, grace, compassion, slow to anger and abounding in lovingness. You did not forsake them. So we saw that. So we know that the Israelites what they wanted to do was they didn't want to listen to Moses for what the things that he that God has already told them was about to happen. So they'd much rather go back to their old ways. Which leads us into the birth of Moses to understand where did he come from. So we're going to go to the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And this is where we're going to spend the majority of our time. And it reads, Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son. When she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, or she could no longer hide him any longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds of the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at, the dis stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to, the, to bathe at the Nile while her maidens walked alongside the Nile. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the boy was crying and she had pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. This is... This, sorry, then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and nurse and call a nurse for the, for the baby, for, for the, uh, call one of the Hebrew women so that she may nurse the child. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go ahead. So go. So the girl went, called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. The child grew and brought, I'm sorry, verse 10, and the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, because I drew him out of the water. So we see that Moses was called beautiful as a baby, which means handsome, a healthy baby boy. And if you notice that our child dedication had more boys than girls, so the boys are coming back really strong. I just got to put point that out. All right. So Moses' parents had faith in God. They knew that the power that was within God, because the power of God was stronger than the power of the king or Pharaoh. We see that in Hebrews 11.23, it says that by faith, when Moses was born, he was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. So a little bit of a backstory of how we got to Moses here. 
the king sought to harm the people of the Israel. And he, basically, he saw that they were multiplying so much, he wanted to kind of dwindle it down because of fear of they would fight or rise up against him. So that's how we got to Moses. What, he, what the king wanted to do was kill off the boys. But here's the good thing about this. The more unjust that Pharaoh was, the more they multiplied. And one thing about the midwives that the Pharaoh tried to use with it, this, that the, Pharaoh, the midwives feared the Lord and not, uh, not Pharaoh because they understood who the Lord was. The midwives were the ones that allowed the boys to live, if you, read, if you go back and read it. One commentary said that when the king demanded an explanation for their disobedience to his command, the midwives lied. They routinely arrived late because they gave the mothers time to hide those baby boys. And I find it very ironic is that the king would use those, uh, those uh, Hebrew women to do his task because the Hebrew women were going to protect their own. Just like every single mother in here is going to protect their own and they're going to protect the own of someone else as well. Their actions that they had, they were blessed with their own families. Moses' mother, Jacobet, and that's spelled J-O-C-H, E B E D. She was the wife, sorry, the mother of Miriam and also Aaron. And her disobedience to Pharaoh gave us this future great Hebrew man. And if you can tell that the family lineage was Miriam, Aaron, and then there was Moses. So Miriam plays a big portion of help in this. And we're going to find out how she's a hero. But we also see that it was Moses' generation that was subject to death. We can assume that the midwives, along with Jacob, all they could all they all they could do was try to hide Moses. One because he was a boy, and also meant there was health benefits that would help her as well. So we're going to look at three heroes. We're going to first start off with Jacob, Moses' mother. She faced a big risk of hiding this baby. Again, there was health reasons. There was the fact that her son could die. There was the, the edict that he would die. But she was not afraid of the king, as I said earlier. Both of his parents produce faith. And Psalms 115.11 says that you who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He, has, he is their help and their shield. And then one commentary said that, you know, Moses about three months when he could be hidden. This guy literally said, and I quote, because newborns were expected to sleep extensively. I heard laughter because if you know a three month old that can sleep extensively, that is a blessed child. Because I, I know that our two children, when Jackson gets up, Molly gets up, daddy gets up, mommy helps Jackson. Jason's the same way. If Jacob wakes up, the next baby that comes, well, Ronnie's going to take care of that baby, and Jason's going to be kicked out of bed for a little bit. Sorry, Jason, there's a couch for you in my house if you need it. <laughs> so Jacoby took the next possible step regarding her son to keep him safe, because how hard is to hide a baby that's crying? She had to put her son in the Nile, but basically she made a wicker basket, or she used a basket, put it with tar and pitch, one that so it was buoyant enough to float that baby, because the average baby, about three months, is what, 12 to 15 pounds? 17 if you're six months? So today we know if we put our child in the river, whether it was tar and pitch, it would still be an acceptable practice. But she, that's what she did. She had to send her son to be saved some way, somehow. And she put him in the thicket, which if you know anything about the South, we have some, so much marsh and thicket, it's easy for that baby to kind of sit there and float along very easily. Because the, the Nile was the main way. It was the, the, the most active spot that you can see something floating. Because you, if you can't see something floating, you're not really looking hard enough. If you just compare it to the Mississippi, if you see a basket in Mississippi, you're going to say, what is that basket far off? That's basically, you know, comparing the Nile to the Mississippi. And also that, the, that there was crocs and there would be open sand banks and there'd be a beach in case that that basket had to stop somewhere and then we see that 
Miriam, his sister, is the second hero. What do we know about this point? She could have been about 12 teenage years. You know, no one really knows. But she plays a crucial role here. She wanted to know what would happen to her brother. So she's following her brother along, but she's also hiding at the same time. So she's not being seen. So the role she plays is very important. She showed initiative and resourcefulness by putting herself forward in front of Pharaoh's daughter. What she does also helps bring her mother back into the picture because Pharaoh's daughter doesn't know who this little girl is. Pharaoh's daughter doesn't know who Moses' mother is. She was the one to suggest help. And this is what her oversight did. Her oversight proposed that an Israelite would, to be, would be the one to nurse the baby. She found the perfect person, which was her mother. She also kept Moses in their family. And she gave the help that was needed for the salvation to come for those Israelites. For Jacobit, this meant that she was able to care for her son, just like we did for the dedication. As parents, we're going to teach our children about the Lord. So that meant that she would teach her own son. And not only was she was to nurse, she was not only to nurse him, but to bring him up at a certain age. And so if you look back, she got paid, not by Pharaoh, but by Pharaoh's daughter. And then we see that there's the hero of Pharaoh's daughter. It was God's provision that led Moses to her. She was coming to bathe. He was coming down the waterway. You see that she couldn't ignore the fact there was a screaming baby. Because we know that if there was a screaming child right now, and there's not, we, wouldn't, we would be the one to be very attentive to see where that sound was coming from. One commentary said that she couldn't ignore the fact that he was in a basket because if Moses had already been circumcised, circumcised which is an ancient Hebrew custom, the princess would have known that he had been born to a Hebrew family. So what did the princess do? She noticed two things. He was a boy and he was a Hebrew child. But we see that she also broke her own father's command to kill because she had a warm heart for this baby. She allowed the baby to live by giving him back to his mother to nurse for a moment to come back. But unwillingly, she unwillingly gave Moses to his mother to care. She also paid. <clears throat> and one could assume that Moses was raised to understand the Hebrew people. But once he was of age, we see that he was raised in the ways of the Egyptian lifestyle. But we see that in verse 11, we, show, we see how he cares for his own people. But then we find what is the um, commonality of these women. God used them in a way with their culture, especially honored women in preserving and raising children. Jacobit's patience was to hide her crying son, to keep him a secret for, what, three months, to teach Moses about his people. We also see that Miriam had the patience to hide her identity that she was Moses' older sister, that her mother was the actual mother. Pharaoh's daughter had the patience to give Moses back at a time probably to learn from his, from his mother and that he would be educated, like I said, by, their, by, their, by the ancient wisdom. And we know that the words of the birth mother would be with him because, again, Moses would see people being oppressed. Carla Frisbee put this on Facebook about 12 o'clock last night when I was up, and it was something that made me think, one, as a counselor, and because she's also a counselor, because Mother's Day is honoring a lot of mothers who have children. However, this is what she said, or this is the post that she shared. She says, you're allowed to be sad on Mother's Day. You're allowed to be angry on Mother's Day. You're allowed to, be, to, to, to seclude yourself on Mother's Day. You're allowed to avoid social media that day. Because hurting is okay, crying is okay, mourning is okay. It doesn't matter if you lost your baby slash child, miscarried, can't carry, and had to make a hardest, the hardest decision of your life. Your adoption fell through, your foster kiddos went back home. You're allowed to mourn. You are allowed to hurt. So before Sunday comes, I see you, I stand with you, and I am covering you 
covering with your love, covering, covering with you love, light, and prayers. Happy You Day. Mother's Day is hard for many women in many ways. And when we think about patience, some of these mothers who are not able to do the things of carrying the child all the way, they're still mothers. Motherhood starts at conception. Fatherhood starts at conception as well. It's very hard for many, like I said, your mother has since passed away or there's a torn relationship, but they're still mothers. Mothers are the heartbeat of the family. They actually keep the grease going because we know that if mama is not at home, daddy's like calling mama every five minutes, uh, where is this, where is that? Mothers are courageous in their everyday life, just as Jacobet was. Moms seek God's approval over everything else, whether it's the way they teach, train, and discipline. So the Lord has supplied us all with mothers, mothers who pray for their child. And we know there's, there's no such thing as a perfect mother, but we know there's a perfect God. And for those who don't have that perfect relationship, he is also there for you as well. There's nothing that our God can do. He loves each and every one of us. So take the time today to not only thank the mothers who are able to carry, thank the mothers who weren't able to carry. And let's show everyone patience, patience three ways, with love, kindness, and respect. Can we pray? <laughs>